Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this show is the Great Gaelic Revolt of the 1270s. In this episode we will look at Norman Ireland in the later 13th century in a story of revolt as generations of resentment among the dispossessed Gaelic Irish exploded into one of the great challenges to Norman domination of Ireland in the medieval period. Life in the medieval village of Sagart in the early 13th century was pleasant. Having been founded not long after the Norman invasion of Ireland in 1169, it had grown from strength to strength. In the shadow of the Wicklow Mountains, southwest of Dublin, the peasants of this small settlement tilled their fields, lived, loved, grew old and died. Their world was slow to change, with life from one generation to the next remaining very similar. However, medieval Sagart was not completely cut off from the wider world. It was situated on the main road south through the Vale of Dublin, the lands between the medieval city and the mountains to its south, so travellers frequently brought news. The 15-day-long Fair of Dublin, held in July, must have been a major attraction for peasants who could easily walk the ten miles to the city. Likewise, the fairs of Maynooth in September and Nace in October must have been big events in the medieval calendar, when merchants from across Europe traded luxurious items such as spices and wine. Even though these goods were way beyond the peasants' purchasing power, the aroma alone must have been salivating. All in all, until the final thirty years of the 13th century, the lives of the peasants in the foothills of the Wicklow Mountains was by no means bad. While it's true, fatal diseases were rampant and famine, although rare, was never further away than a failed harvest and indeed the average lifespan ended around 40. These were the natural rhythms of medieval life across Europe from the Atlantic Ocean to the Black Sea. Between such tough times, people could enjoy the good years of plenty. On long summer's evenings, the peasants of Sagart could look out over the lush Vale of Dublin while they were regaled with songs and stories, such as the medieval Irish epic of Dermot and the Earl, which recounted the Norman conquest of Ireland and told how these peasants and their forefathers had come from Britain to live in the foothills of the Wicklow Mountains. This lifestyle was not unique to Sagart. All across the Vale of Dublin, the lands south of the city, dozens of settlements thrived in a similar fashion. Key to their success was the relatively peaceful relationship the settlers enjoyed with the neighbouring Gaelic Irish in the Wicklow Mountains. The Gaelic Irish could not be said to have enjoyed the benefits of the Norman conquest of Ireland. Indeed, if anything, the opposite was the case. They had lost power, prestige and land. High in the mountains, large numbers of Gaelic Irish had been resettled in the poor uplands, where Norman rule was no more than overlordship. Meanwhile, in the lowlands, like at Sagart, the Normans had transformed the lands the Gaelic Irish had once ruled. The economy and society were fundamentally different now. Large numbers of peasants had come in from Wales and England to work the land, alongside some Gaelic peasants who had remained behind after the conquest. Despite this disenfranchisement, tensions remained surprisingly low. Indeed, intermarriage was common. Many Gaelic women married Norman settlers and moved to the colony. There were some exceptions, of course, to the peaceful relations. Most notably, in 1209, when there was a large-scale attack at Cullenswood, that's the modern suburb of Ranala, when the Gaelic Irish from the Wicklow Mountains rode down and massacred scores of colonists, celebrating a festival a few miles from the city walls. However, all in all, this was an era of limited large-scale violence. Indeed, most towns were built without walls, as there was little need for such expensive defences. Indeed, the greatest threat to peace in the first century after the conquest was the ongoing factionalism between the Norman powers, and this was evident in the Wicklow region, where the Fitzgeralds, the Butlers, and, one that might surprise many people, the Archbishop of Dublin, vied for control over the region. While there was little outward expression of the resentment from the Gaelic Irish toward the Anglo-Normans, such sentiments 
did linger beneath the surface. It's not surprising really, is it? Even though many had been able to accommodate themselves into the new Norman structure, the Gaelic Irish had lost out massively by the invasion. Not only had they lost power and status, but they now lived in a world where they were second class citizens many being excluded from even using Norman law. While this wound of resentment would fester beneath the surface for decades, when a vicious famine struck in 1270, these tensions became too great, and nearly a century of pent-up rage exploded. Twelve seventy proved to be the decisive year when heavy snows and poor weather made life for the Gaelic Irish high in the Wicklow Mountains unbearable. The poor weather was matched by a poor harvest, resulting in what the annals called Great Famine and Scarcity in All Erin later in the year. Initially, the trouble began far away from settlements like Sagarth. Deep in the Wicklow Mountains, where Norman control had always been tenuous, the first murmurings of revolt were felt. It appears trouble first broke out on the lands of the Archbishop of Dublin, most likely at Glenmalure, where the O'Burns and O'Tools had settled after the upheaval of the invasion. The famine after 1270 gave them no choice but to attack the richer Norman settlements. These raids, as we shall see, could be violent for anyone who stood in the way of the starving, alienated Gaelic Irish. And soon the Archbishop of Dublin, Fouke de Sanford, faced what he called a malicious rebellion in his lands. Unable to deal with the situation, he needed outside help, calling on the king's representative, the justiciar James de Audley, to keep control. De Sanford, however, was an old hand in the Wicklow region, having been archbishop since 1256. So, instead of just using force, he also sent a relation, John de Sanford, to Wicklow, to negotiate with the Gaelic Irish in the mountains and it seems that the situation was calmed momentarily at least but unquestionably deep in the mountains tensions were frayed this was a fragile peace and it would soon be blown apart when the entire Wicklow region faced what can only be described as a perfect storm The year 1271, in any situation, would have been immensely difficult, as the harvest faltered again, producing the all-too-predictable food shortages, and the annals reported a great famine so that multitudes of poor people died of cold and hunger, and the rich suffered hardship. The reference to the rich suffering hardship is a measure of the depth of the famine and chronic food shortages faced by people that winter. The conditions in the Wicklow Mountains must have been unbearable. While this famine unquestionably destabilised the region further, worse was to follow, when the Archbishop of Dublin and the greatest landholder in the region, Fouk de Sanford, died. As one of the biggest landowners in the mountains, his death created a vacuum as his position was not properly filled until 1279. In the eight years between his death and the arrival of his successor, the Archbishop's lands in Wicklow were administered by royal officials who clumsily dealt with the very delicate situation. The combination of a starving people who already felt resentment at the conquest and officials who did not understand the situation led to an explosion of violence in 1271 as the Gaelic Irish now attacked settlements to the east of the mountains along the coastal plain of Wicklow. In a desperate measure to keep the peace, hostages were taken from the O'Burns and O'Tools and a third family, the Harrells, who had joined the revolt. Keeping the prisoners at Castle Kevin, a fortified settlement deep in the mountains, the authorities hoped that this would help to keep the peace. However, the justiciar James de Ordley still had to arrive in person in the valley of Glendalough near Castle Kevin in 1272 to try and quell the continued violence, but the situation was clearly getting out of control. Little is known of de Audley's mission that year, but the fact that his war horse was killed, for which he was later compensated 25 marks, indicates the fighting did not go well. It was clear de Audley was not up to the task, 
and he was replaced by a new justiciar, Morris Fitzmaurice Fitzgerald, who attempted to attack the Gaelic Irish in the remote valley of Glenmalure in April 1273, but he also failed. As the wider Wicklow region slipped into open violence, the new King of England, Edward I, was returning from crusade in the Middle East. In 1273, he took a hands-on approach and appointed Geoffrey de Jeanville, who was the Lord of Trim in Mead and a fellow crusader, as justiciar to resolve the situation. Having fought the great Mamluk Sultan Baibars in the Middle East, de Jeanville was an experienced soldier and seemingly what was needed in the situation. But Geoffrey de Jeanville would soon learn the mountains and passes of Wicklow were a world away from the searing heat of the eastern Mediterranean. Before we continue, I would like to take a quick break. With the revolt and attacks on the colonial settlements in full swing in 1274, Geoffrey de Jeanville, the new justiciar, sanctioned the first major attack into the mountains. This foray had a distinctly crusader feel about it. It was not led by the Jeanville himself, but instead by the warrior monks, the Knights Hospitaller, and their Grand Master in Ireland, the Prior William Fitzroger. The Hospitallers had a major foundation just west of medieval Dublin, where the suburb of Kilmainham stands today. The other major military order in the city, the Knights Templar, could not participate as they were explicitly forbidden to fight fellow Christians. The Hospitallers were joined by soldiers from across the Norman colony, but despite the impressive force that left Dublin under the Hospitaller flag of a white cross emblazoned on a black standard, the heavy cavalry they deployed when they reached the heavily wooded mountainous terrain of Wicklow was not up to the task. In the mountain passes they were routed by the more mobile Gaelic Irish and the Grand Master of the Knights Hospitaller, William Fitzroger, and the Sheriff of Limerick, Oliver Legra, were two of the prisoners taken, only to be released later in a prisoner exchange. This great victory for the Gaelic Irish was a clear sign, if one was needed, that the revolt was getting completely out of control. While the victory deflated the Normans, it served to have the opposite effect on the Gaelic Irish. Up to 1274, the revolt had been led by the O'Toole's and O'Burns. Historically, the overlords of these two families had been the powerful MacMurra family from South Wicklow. They, however, had developed a good relationship with the Normans and were even related to the Lord of Carlow, Roger Bigot. However, by 1274, it was clear that their dominant position within the Gaelic community of Wicklow was being challenged by those leading this successful revolt. Unwilling to allow this position be usurped by the O'Burns or the O'Tools, Murtagh MacMurra and his brother Art led their wider family into open rebellion. Soon a vast arc of territory from East Wicklow through the Vale of Dublin and into the northern Barrow Valley was in danger of attack. Life in the prosperous community of Sagarth in the foothills of the mountains was devastated in raid after raid, making life untenable. In one raid that we know about, the Gaelic Irish swept down on Sagart, attacking the peasants in broad daylight, killing 40 people as they worked in the fields. We can only begin to imagine the terror of life in these exposed settlements. Unsurprisingly, many tenants fled their homes after attacks, which killed relatives and did not return for years. Successive raids on Sagart devastated the community. We know that at least 3,000 sheep, 200 cattle, 200 pigs, silver and even clothes were listed by the community in an inventory of goods stolen. However, their fate was by no means unique. Dozens, perhaps hundreds of raids during this period saw numerous communities that ringed the Wicklow Mountains suffer a similar fate. We get a glimpse of what life in these settlements must have been like a few decades later when an entire village who were clearly living on tenterhooks fled their homes after just hearing the words Felak Abu, the war cry of the O'Tools. No doubt many people went to sleep at night wondering would they awake to find their homes being burned and pillaged. 
the level of destruction appears to have been at its worst at Castle Kevin, a settlement on the other side of the Wicklow Mountains, close to Glendalough. Between 1271 and 1277, the lands around Castle Kevin yielded only £8, 14 shillings and 10.5 pence. This was down from the £56 recorded for the year 1229 alone. De Jeanville, the great soldier, was clearly failing and in 1275 he tried to defeat the Gaelic Irish and stabilise the situation in the mountains, but again he failed. It was clear by the middle of the 1270s the revolt, which was in its fifth year, had no sign of abating. Indeed, the only consolation that year was the capture of Murkertoch MacMurra alive. While the Jeanville may have hoped this would blunt the rebels' spirit, it only served to clear the way for the rise of Murkertoch's brother, Art, who above all others would go on to haunt the colonists as he became synonymous with raids and attacks. Indeed, it wouldn't be long before the Jeanville himself would become acquainted with Art. By 1276, the King in England, Edward I, was putting major pressure on the Jeanville to resolve the situation in Wicklow. De Jeanville had been appointed just this year, three years earlier, and it was clear he was failing abysmally. A revolt that had started in East Wicklow now had drawn in all the Gaelic Irish in the region, and a vast swathe of the colony from Carlow to Dublin was vulnerable. That year of 1276, de Jeanville organised another mission. He staked everything on this new attack. He himself alone brought a force of over 2,000 vassals from his lands in Meath. He was joined by other magnates from across Ireland, including Thomas de Clare, the Lord of Thomond. This enormous force based themselves in Newcastle, in East Wicklow, but this was far from ideal as it was at least a day's march from their target, the mountain pass of Glenmalur, where the Gaelic Irish were based. For de Jeanville, as he led his force into the Wicklow Mountains, he could not possibly have gotten further from the deserts of the Middle East, where he had fought just a few years previously. Glenmalur was a long, narrow, steep side of valley in a remote region of South Wicklow. Heavily forested, the valley favoured the defenders led by Arth MacMurra, and the disaster that awaited the Jeanville could not have been imagined as they had left the fortress at Newcastle. They were not only defeated, but this time the army was trapped in the mountain pass by the Gaelic Irish. They were reduced to dire straits, and according to the annals of Clonmac Noise, they were forced to eat their horses. Some would eventually escape, including the Jeanville, although he was heavily wounded. This finished his career as just this year, he would not be able to resolve the ever-growing situation, and in 1277 he was replaced by Ralph de Ufford, who would go on to launch yet another campaign. De Ufford was a far more clever strategist, and he picked a more suitable base of operations at Castle Kevin, situated far closer to Glen Malour and Glendalough. Finally, in that summer of 1277, de Ufford enjoyed a military victory driving the Gaelic Irish from Glenmalure. This campaign must have been horrifically brutal. Glenmalure was not just a military base, but it was the home to hundreds of Gaelic families. Nevertheless, de Offord's great victory pacified the region to a limited degree. In a letter he wrote to the king, he summarised the situation. The affairs in Ireland are much improved. However, he went on to note, the thieves who were in Glendalory, what the Normans called Glenmalure, have departed. Many of them have gone to another strong place. During this successful campaign of 1277, the settlement at Castle Kevin was transformed into a military fortress in an attempt to shore up Norman control in East Wicklow. In the aftermath, it appears the region was relatively pacified and revenues from the lands surrounding Castle Kevin soared to a hundred and eighteen pounds, three shillings and two pence, over ten times the amount that had been collected in the previous six years. It was obvious that the peasants could return and safely work the land. However, it was not to last, and by April twelve seventy nine, raiding had broken out again, 
No money at all was received from Castle Kevin during these first three months of 1279 as tenants yet again fled their lands. But unquestionably the revolt was running out of steam. The Ufford seemed to have landed a catastrophic blow in 1277. Nonetheless, in the following years, sporadic violence would erupt. In 1281, no taxes were returned from Castle Kevin again, along with the manors at Kilmacburn and Kilmaston, due to what was described as war with the Irish. For people trying to survive at Castle Kevin, life during this period must have been unbearable. While the revolt was petering out in the early 1280s, the new justiciar of Ireland, the Archbishop of Waterford, Stephen de Fulburn, was willing to keep the peace by literally any means. In 1282, there were murmurings of a fresh revolt, and when the two McMurrah brothers arrived in Arklo, having been summoned there to travel to England, de Fulburn took action to ensure they would not go back to war. Before the two men could board ship, an assassin, Geoffrey de Pencote, acting on de Fulburn's orders, killed the two McMurrah brothers. The assassination had the desired effect, as what little attacks there had been now petered out. Although the revolt ended, the events of the 1270s had shattered the peace that had reigned in the region, and this would never be rebuilt. In 1295, a ferocious cycle of violence began when famine drove the Gaelic Irish into revolt again. This time, it would not be contained and by the 1320s a vast tract of Wicklow had fallen from Norman control. Despite the fact that widespread violence and depredation followed in the decades to come, it was always the memory of the revolt of the 1270s and in particular Arthur McMurrah who haunted the colonists' imagination over the following years. In 1305, when a woman, Mariotta de Riddlesford, arrived in court in Castle Dermot in the shade of the Wicklow Mountains, she had to prove her age. One of the witnesses, William Wyden, testified that he could remember Mariotta's birthday to the 21st of July, 1282. This was not a day to forget, but not because Mariotta de Riddlesford had been born, but because, as William Wyden went on to testify, it was on that day that Art McMurrow was slain, and it is known in the whole country that 23 years have passed since Art McMurr was slain. At Sagart, the village that was destroyed, his memory would last a lot longer. Incredibly, in 1343, over six decades after Art McMurr had been assassinated, the tenants referenced time of the war of Art McMurr as a reason why they had large debts owing to the crown. Although no one could possibly have remembered Arth or the raids, it was clear he had entered popular culture of the 14th century in Ireland. It's not surprising really though. He was integral to the revolt which saw Norman life in the region become a struggle for survival, one that would continue for decades. Don't forget, if you want to see the sites associated with this fascinating subject, book your place on the tour now at History at irishhistorypodcast.ie Until next time, Sloan.